Well, hello again, everyone. I guess word leaked out about the gunpowder plot, and someone set off the alarm so that we all would vacate the building before Guy Fawkes and his conspirators blew up uh, the Hardin Student Center, right? Well, uh, even though I'm dismayed that class ended early, uh, Spider-Man is encouraging me to go ahead and uh, record the remainder of the lecture on English descent and send it out to you. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's envision my little crude drawing on the whiteboard. Remember that Parliament meets here with the King and the House of Lords and beneath Parliament is a basement. Well, over here is a warehouse that shares the same basement. And so Guy Fawkes and his uh, conspirators entered the warehouse, went down to the basement, went underneath Parliament, and uh, set up barrels of gunpowder, which were set to go off and uh, uh, kill everyone in Parliament. Now, someone uh, uh, revealed the plot because they were concerned about some of their friends that were going to be uh, killed in Parliament. And so Guy Fawkes and the conspirators were arrested. They all were hanged. All right. Now, uh, what's interesting is that Guy Fawkes Day continues to be celebrated today in England. All right. November the 5th and they have a bonfire, they burn a uh, Guy Fawkes in effigy, fireworks goes off, and uh, so it's generally uh, a time of, uh, of uh, you know, hoopla, and, you know, they're not necessarily celebrating, they're just looking for an excuse for a party and fireworks. Sounds like New Orleans, right? But that is uh, the story behind Guy Fawkes and the gunpowder plot. All right. Um, let's, um, I'm going to uh, bring up the, uh, the PowerPoint now. Give me just a moment. All right, uh, so here is the issue with Parliament. Uh, Parliament was necessary for the king to raise taxes. And Parliament is divided between the House of Lords and the House of Commons. And obviously the Lords are the nobility and uh, the Commons are uh, the... Uh, more the the common people and the house of commons supported the puritans they opposed the idea of james absolute monarchy and so james had to rely upon the house of lords but resisted assembling parliament because he feared that parliament would uh, reduce his uh, divine right of kingship all right when james died his son charles the first took the throne and he continued his father's policies of, of absolute monarchy and rule without, without parliament. And he pressed for control over a religion. He pressed for uniformity of religious practices. He aligned himself with the episcopacy. And so like a James, he realized that his rule was dependent upon uh, the support of the Church of England. And so he was very oppressive toward the dissenters. And his chief uh, ally in this was William Laud, who was Archbishop of Canterbury. And uh, he uh, joined with uh, Charles in insisting on conformity to the Book of Common Prayer. And he oppressed all the dissenters. Uh, Puritans, Presbyterians, Baptists, and Congregationalists. Well, ultimately, civil war brought an end to the rule of Charles and Laud. 
um, the uh, the Scots invaded, okay, and uh, Charles was forced to assemble the Parliament in order to raise the finances necessary to defend uh, England. But Parliament eroded Charles's power until finally civil war erupted. Uh, the Parliament executed Archbishop Laud. Uh, the Parliament had its own pro-Puritan army and they allied with the Scots and defeated the Royalist army. Okay, so the, uh, the Civil War ended uh, in favor of the Puritans. In 1649, Parliament uh, took Charles to trial and beheaded him. All right, bringing an end, a temporary end, to the monarchy, and Oliver Cromwell was elected the protector, okay? So uh, he didn't refer to himself as king, uh, but he considered himself the Lord Protector. Uh, unfortunately, the protectorate collapsed. Uh, after his death, his son Richard uh, was not a good leader. And so this period of time between 1648 and 1660 is known as the interregnum, uh, the period of time between the reigns of the kings. Well, during this interregnum, uh, the, uh, the Scots allied with English Parliament and they called the Westminster Assembly. And that established the Reformed Church in the three kingdoms of the British Isles. England, Scotland, and Ireland. And so now the state-supported church is uh, the Reformed Church or the Presbyterians. And so the Presbyterians, uh, being familiar with how it feels to be oppressed, well then uh, they're going to offer religious freedom to all religions, right? Wrong. Once again, we see that when a persecuted uh, church uh, accedes to power, they maintain the same union of church and state, and they continue to oppress any dissenters. And so during the interregnum, Baptists actually suffered under the leadership of the Presbyterians, which was uh, profoundly unfair because the Baptists had been strong supporters in the Civil War, and they had made major contributions to the success of the dissenters against Charles. Well, uh, in 1660, uh, because of the failure of uh, Richard Cromwell, uh, the Protectorate ended, and uh, the, um, the, the Parliament was forced to ask Charles II to return from exile. Charles was the son of Charles I. And so this period is called the Restoration. So the Church of England and the, uh, the Episcopal rule was restored, and the latter state was worse than the first. Okay, Charles II also believed in absolute monarchy by divine right, and the power struggle ensued between Charles and the Church and Parliament. All right, so we had just a continuation of uh, the status under James and Charles I. The Clarendon Code was passed. This was another uh, series of laws uh, passed to force all dissenters into submission to the Church of England and the King. So you see that all uh, public officials were required to take communion in the Church of England all ministers and teachers of the church had to give full assent to the Book of Common Prayer. Remember, their, uh, their uh, salaries were paid by the state. Uh, the Conventicle Act prohibited anyone from meeting for worship without the Book of Common Prayer. And so, of course, this would uh, subject the separatists to um, uh, serious uh, repercussions. And uh, dissenting ministers uh, who were deposed from their position uh, could not just open up another church, all right? They could not live within five miles of their previous congregation, so they were scattered uh, so that they could not resume their, uh, their worship meetings. 
I want to mention, since we're talking about separatists, I neglected earlier to emphasize that the founder of the separatists was named Robert Brown. And in fact, often the separatists were referred to as Brownists because they were followers of uh, Robert Brown. So uh, here are some of the results of persecution, and you're going to want to uh, learn at least a couple of these. Um, as always, severe persecution weeded out the nominal dissenters and purified and strengthened those who remained so that they had a strong witness in the face of persecution. Uh, they had a strong witness that they were willing to endure persecution for their faith. And persecution forced the dissenters to cooperate with each other, to share ministers uh, and other resources because they were stretched thin through fines and imprisonments. And so look at this, dissent made Baptists more respectable, all right? Uh, the Presbyterians had looked down on the other uh, dissenters when they were in charge, but now they also are persecuted and so they uh, demonstrated more affinity with Baptists and Congregationalists. Now, sadly, uh, the dissenters were weakened because their resources were drained through this long period, almost 30 years after the Restoration, uh, uh, the dissenters struggled. Um, and ultimately, uh, this struggle led to a fortress mentality. Simply surviving was a monumental task for the persecuted dissenters. Well, uh, when Charles II died, his brother James II, another son of Charles I, uh, James II became king. Well, he openly favored Roman Catholicism, okay? And uh, he was opposed by the Church of England. The uh, aristocrats in particular, but also the, uh, the, uh, the church leaders, all right? So, uh, and the dissenters opposed him. All political figures opposed him. All right, so they were fearful that James II would attempt to return England to the Catholic Church, just as uh, Mary had done, all right? And so everyone was opposed to James and uh, forced his deposition, okay? And so then they invited his daughter Mary and her husband, William III, to come and rule England. Mary was uh, James's daughter. William was the leading defender of Protestantism in Europe. And so they brought about what's known as the Glorious Revolution. Glorious because there was no bloodshed, no civil war. They simply deposed uh, James II and uh, brought about the, uh, the end of persecution of dissenters. They passed the Act of Toleration in 1689, okay? The Act of Toleration. You'll want to remember this very important uh, document. Now, the Act of Toleration uh, brought an end to persecution of dissent and allowed dissenters to worship. Nonetheless, it still endorsed the Church of England. And um, dissenters were uh, legal only if they were Trinitarian. All right, so any anti-Trinitarian sect was uh, forbidden. But uh, Trinitarian dissenters were allowed to worship if they pledged loyalty to the monarch. And again, they were willing to do this. Uh, it's not that they uh, were opposed to the monarchy. They were opposed to the monarch's suppression of uh, dissent and the forcing of conscience. So uh, they had to pledge loyalty to the monarch. The ministers had to assent to the 39 articles of the Church of England. Now, there were some exceptions because Baptists would not um, uh, assent to allegiance to the bishops because they had their own pastors, nor would they agree to infant baptism. And so uh, Baptists 
uh, had to assent to only 37 and a half articles. But now here was the rub. Uh, they could not lock their meeting houses and they had to register places of worship. And so they were concerned that uh, if this act were repealed or if James returned as king, then their meeting houses would be registered and their locations known and open. And so they were fearful that they would then face retaliation. Uh, fortunately, that did not happen. And dissenters were still second-class citizens because uh, public office holders still were required to take communion in the Church of England. You may know that in our original constitution, the only reference to religion at all is Article 6 that states that um, there shall be no religious test for public office. And this is a result of uh, this, uh, this law in England that uh, all office holders had to take a religious test, and that is communion with the Church of England. All right, but nonetheless, the act of toleration, um, even though it was not fully tolerant, nonetheless, it did legalize uh, dissenting churches and allowed them to worship. Well, you would think that uh, the act of toleration and uh, liberation from persecution would mean that the dissenting churches would, would, uh, would grow and flourish, but actually uh, the dissenting churches faced a decline. And here are several reasons uh, for that. Really, society overall experienced a moral laxity. There was a reaction against the severe Puritanism that was displayed during the interregnum. Um, many of the churches were preoccupied with consolidation, organization, and theological trivia. All of a sudden, they had the time and leisure to argue over uh, theology, like Trinitarianism and Calvinism. And so some of the uh, dissenters went into these extremes and their churches declined because of liberal theology or this hyper-Calvinism that uh, dictated against evangelism and missions. Well, just like today, there's the lure of secular attractions that took people's attention away from the things of God. They intermarried with other faiths, and so there was less uh, sincerity and less focus on uh, the Baptist, Presbyterian faiths, and so on. Uh, now, all of a sudden, they were able to uh, succeed in business. That gave them a taste for wealth, another distraction. And uh, they began to come up in the world and become respectable, and that led to compromise. And then third-generation dissenters actually forgot the principles of dissent altogether. And so we're going to see a decline among the dissenters, particularly uh, this decline is uh, well noted among Baptists, but the good news is that uh, there was a, there's not just a few decades later there's going to be new revival among the general Baptists and the particular Baptists. And uh, those students who are uh, dually enrolled in Baptist heritage are about to, uh, to learn about the decline and the revival among Baptists. All right, well, thank you for your attention to, uh, to this um, Snagit presentation of the uh, lecture that we missed today. I'm sorry, we're already behind, and so I couldn't just uh, make this up uh, later on. So I want everyone to listen to this, and our we've got a new keyword, King Jimmy. All right. So in honor of our two uh, kings uh, by the name of James, King Jimmy is the um, the keyword for our Snagit document. All right. Thank y'all for listening. Spider-Man and I say so long, and we'll, I will see you on Thursday. Okay? Bye-bye.